Christ Church. It is such a pleasure to see all of you this morning. Welcome to worship. I am Pastor Beth, and I am, I'm like, I have the privilege of being with all of you this morning. I'm in kind of a goofy frame of mind, so you'll have to forgive me. If you are joining us online, welcome. We are so glad to have you. I have a couple of announcements before we get started. The first one is that for at least one more week, the office is going to continue to be open by appointment only. We are available. Please give us a call. You can come in and meet with us and have a good time, but we are asking that you call ahead to do that. Please feel free to fill out one of these welcome cards, especially if you are with us for the first time. Let us know who you are. Also, at the end of service, stop by at the back door on your way out and say hello so that I can remember your name next week when you come. If you do fill out one of these and you have some prayers or praises, you can either share those with the church or you can just share them with the pastor. They will be prayed over throughout the entire week. Next week, we're going to have a really exciting announcement about Frontier Sunday, but I'm going to make it be a cliffhanger, so all of you have to come back or tune in next week so that you can hear that announcement because it's going to be a lot of fun. Finally, today we are going to continue our humming of the hymns, Hum with Gusto, friends, and soon and very soon, I promise, we will be back to singing. With that, let us worship God together. Please stand. In you, O oh Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your 
righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust, O oh Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is constant with you. scriptures this morning is from Luke 4 verses 21 to 30 and 1 Corinthians 13 1 to 13. Then he began to speak to them. Remember he had just handed back the scrolls. Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow in Z at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, 
I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for the prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end, for we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been known fully. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I had a moment while I was getting ready for this that I was like, hmm. <laughs> this is one of those physician heal thyself sermons. I see how it is, God. Thanks a lot. So the greatest gift. Now, over the last 18 months, we have tried out some unusual pairings of scripture. If you know anything about me, it is that I really enjoy the challenge of putting two hard pieces together. But I think this one might take the cake. If you were looking for a description of dichotomy, my friends, I give you Exhibit A. On the one hand, we have one of the most popular pieces of scripture in the Bible. How many of you have heard 1 Corinthians 13 before? <laughs> you probably saw that and there was like a little inward groan. You're like, where's the wedding? <laughs> And then, of course, on the other hand, we have a message about Jesus preaching a sermon that so enrages the good people of his hometown that they try to throw him off a cliff. <laughs> I was like, how many of you have ever wanted to do that to your preacher? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Why on earth would we put these two pieces of scripture together? And, of course, we see it right away, don't we? Surely it is because one is the model for how we are to respond to God's love, how we are called to treat one another, how we hold the message of salvation, and the other is not. Except that the gospel stories we hear and have before us are not just models of how to respond to God's grace, but they also offer us a mirror to our own responses. As we have talked about repeatedly in the opening chapters of Luke, this gospel is set out to let us see ourselves reflected in it, our full range of responses, all of the possibilities of what it means to be a human being interacting with the work of the divine, the living word of God, or, in the words of Paul, the work of love. Even if we do not see ourselves in the good townsfolk of Nazareth and who end up chasing the Messiah out of the synagogue, this story is about the human tendency to listen for what we want to hear, good, bad, or otherwise, and the inflexibility that sometimes happen when what we hear does not match up to what we were listening for. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever experienced that, right? <laughs> How many of you have been in a situation where miscommunication took place? Raise your hand. Oh, thank goodness, you're all human. Now, raise your hand if you were involved in a miscommunication this last week. Anyone out there? 
Oh, friends, I was involved in like an epic miscommunication. It was awesome. Now, here's the harder question. This miscommunication that might have happened, was it the other person's fault? They maybe didn't hear you or they weren't listening or maybe they misheard you because a car was going by. Raise your hand if it was the other person's fault. <laughs> I... <laughs> I saw one of you elbow the other person. I'm like, oh yeah, I know that feeling, right? Now raise your hand if it was your fault. <laughs> Brave people, you misspoke or maybe, here's the worst one, here's the one that sometimes happens to me. Maybe you even spoke thoughtlessly. Granted, most of us are not going to run anyone off a physical cliff, nor do I think any of us chased anyone else there. But dangerous edges, the edges we run up to, they don't have to be physical rocky ledges to create missed opportunities, to cause harm, or even to break relationships. And the interesting thing about this story or parable is that it isn't about a random group of people's reaction to the hard words of a stranger. Jesus isn't some random wandering rabbi or a hermit holy man coming to town to proclaim an impossible truth. Jesus is Joseph's son. He's a local kid. These folks know him. They helped raise him. And now, now they are rejecting him. But before we stand on that edge, let's talk a moment about love. I'm going to ask you an interactive question. So I had a teacher who always used to say, screw your thinking caps on. And I never, I was like, where do I screw it on to? But <laughs> maybe take your head and, and get it revved up, right? What is love? When you think about love, what comes to mind? Or perhaps better ask, who comes to mind? So I say the word love and you say? Oh, that was lovely. Some of you had some really beautiful and tender answers, although I, I only heard kind of these couple in the front. I heard names of people that we love deeply. Now, as a millennial raised in the United States, I have had a good deal of cultural training in this subject. Are you ready? According to every romantic comedy I have ever seen or read, love is a magical emotion that spontaneously emerges between two people who are randomly thrown together in an impossible situation where they discover they have absolutely perfect chemistry together. And after overcoming some totally unlikely obstacle, they end up living in the moment happily ever after. Oh my goodness, how many of you have found that love? <laughs> I saw some more elbows happening. <laughs> okay, maybe love isn't that. But then, is it the emotion I feel for my dogs? and my shoes and my favorite food, which happens to be pizza, wait, I didn't say that out loud, or my friends and my family, is it the same thing I have for my significant other? How can that possibly be right? Lord have mercy, who thinks that love is complex? Yeah, awesome. Some of you are like, except I've got love all figured out, Pastor. We're gonna talk afterwards, you come talk to me. Paul does not ease our complexity when it comes to love. Rather, he gives love the kind of love we express toward other people, the kind of love we express towards ourselves, the kind of love we offer to God, a different framework. For Paul, love is not a human emotion. It is the most important gift of the Holy Spirit, but it is not a human emotion. It is the gift of the Spirit that makes all other gifts possible. It is the guaranteed gift from God that each of us is given for the common good. No matter what other gifts you might have, in each of us lives this superpower that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. 
It is love that allows us to participate fully in the body of Christ. It is love that saves us. It is love that we are called to cultivate and share with one another and with God. And finally, of the gifts we have, it is love that will continue eternally because love goes on. It never ends. What we see here in 1 Corinthians 13 is that love is the gift that allows us to make space for, first of all, our full self to show up. It also allows us to make space for other people to fully show up. And finally, it allows us to make space for God to fully show up in our own lives. Love allows us to listen without casting a net of expectation over what we hear. Love makes it possible to encounter other people and God in terms other than our own. And now why would that be important? Because the full work of God can't emerge if we are blanketing everyone and everything, the whole world, with our experience. And the other people, if we're blanketing them with our expectations and conditions, they can't emerge and have space to be who it is that God has called them to be. This is what happens in the story from Luke. Armed with their expectations about what God will do through their Messiah, right? Jesus grew up here. Knowing that this young man was raised in this community, believing that they already know what it means when Jesus says, I have come to proclaim good news to the poor, bring sight to the blind, freedom to the captive, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. These good people sit back and hear Jesus say what they wanted him to say as he reads the scroll. He has come among them to do good work, to ease their lives, to give them what they believe they deserve from God the same way he did over in Capernaum. Now, can you think of times in your own lives when you have cast an expectation on someone or something only to be profoundly disappointed by what happens next? Any of you been in that boat? I see a lot of nodding heads, yeah. There is a subtle and invasive expectation about having faith in God, about being a good Christian, that if we love God and are faithful, God's answer to us will be yes, that God will always fulfill the want we have the way we want it fulfilled, that the outcome will always be what we desire. Now, rationally, I know every single one of you knows that this is not true, but like the people of Nazareth, our expectations are powerful, and sometimes they can get in the way. We can find God saying something we do not want to hear. We can find those we love doing things we do not want them to do. Paul invites us to remember that love will make space for the reality of what is emerging, of what we are hearing and experiencing. Love will teach us how to respond with grace and compassion rather than anger and rage. Now, we are human, right? We are still going to feel a little anger and rage. That is normal and human. But love, what it does is it allows us to say, oh, look, I'm a little angry about that. I wonder why that is. And then let it go. Or look, I'm having a little outrage in this moment. What's going on here? And it gives us some space to step back and to allow that emotion to move through rather than linking into it and giving it a story and trying to interpret what that story means. Love opens us to what is emerging. So again, let's look at the story from Luke. This is our example. If the people of Nazareth had been ex exercising the spiritual practice of love, what they might have felt 
yes, is anger, and disappointment that Jesus had just said the equivalent to them of, I will not feed your widows, and I will not heal your sick. Right? If your pastor came to you and said, I am not here to bring you a good word, you would probably be a little miffed, right? Maybe? Huh. Some of you are like, I don't know. <laughs> I think I'd be okay with that. No. <laughs> right? So Jesus is giving them something that really crushes them. It, it disappoints them. But then, after noticing that they felt this way, what might have happened is they could have asked Jesus, Lord, why not? Or maybe, here's a good one, then Jesus, tell us how we might participate in the work God is doing. Who knows what might have happened if they had asked Jesus some questions, turned to curiosity, used self-reflection, rather than feeding their anger and disappointment. And perhaps that is one of the most provoking lessons from this parable, my friends. Because unlike other places where people misunderstand and argue with Jesus, these people simply stop wanting to hear entirely. And the result isn't just that they try to toss Jesus off a cliff, although that's quite a dramatic image. Jesus passes through them without being seen or heard. Jesus leaves them entirely. God's work continues, but it passes them by. How much do we miss when we are listening to fulfill our own expectations, when we are not making space for the work that God is doing in us and others? there is a real possibility that like the good people of Nazareth, and I mean it when I say they are good people, like them, we might find the good news simply passes us by. We miss out on God's work entirely for that moment. Not forever. Certainly there will be other opportunities for these people to participate in God's work. But in this moment, I believe that is why this story of rejection is right up front in the Gospel of Luke, because there are times when all of us respond this way, and God doesn't want us to miss out. Perhaps, perhaps, that is why this story has been paired with 1 Corinthians 13 in the lectionary this way, because the work of love doesn't end just because we made a mistake. The work of love is never a one-time deal, because the work of love is the greatest gift we have been given. And our challenge, our challenge is to learn to make space to listen for that loving work of God, even when it is hard, even when we don't want to hear. So friends, let us be about that greatest gift, the work of love. Amen.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. receive this benediction. Go forth in peace and the grace of Christ and the love of God and the harmony of the Holy Spirit be with you in all you do. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. My friends, you may be seated for the postlude. Thank you. 